Good morning. How's everybody today? Uh, let's see, how many Irish people do we have in the house? That's right. We are the leprechauns everyone is afraid of. <laughs> it's great to see you all this morning. We're in the book of Hebrews, and uh, one of the challenges in reading through Scripture in Hebrews is the frequency with which there is a reference to a passage in the Old Testament. And because the author is writing to people who are very knowledgeable of those passages, uh, he just incorporates it in by usually saying something like, it was said or he said. And so it can feel a little bit disjointed to us who are not as familiar with those passages. So we're going to work through. You'll notice when I read through this morning, there's, there's some references to some of those Old, pas Old Testament passages. Uh, in verse 5 of chapter 2 in Hebrews, it says, It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. There is a place where someone has testified, and this is a reference that actually comes from Psalm uh, 8. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, or son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. And you crowned them with glory and honor. You put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at the present, we do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should be made the pioneer of their salvation, perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, and this is a reference to Psalm 22, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. I want you to think about that. God actually says he has a song about you that he sings in front of other people. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. We're talking about family this morning, and uh, when I say that, you may immediately think of your own family, and for some of us in the room, that's, that's a, a reasonably positive experience. Our family was a solid family, which means that when they made promises, they usually kept them, and uh, they found ways to show care and kindness to you, and there was support when you needed some assistance and help. Uh, lots of other uh, people, their, our experience could be very different from that. Uh, some of us feel like we've come from a broken family. Uh, promises were made but not kept, and when they were not kept, someone usually got blamed for it. It was never the fault of the person who failed to keep their promise. There may have been moments of caring, but usually they were unpredictable and often strings were attached to it. The support was often lacking, especially when you thought you needed it the most, and excuses would just abound as to why they couldn't help. And uh, the truth is, is that every family is a little bit of a mixed bag. We've got some folks that are, are really supportive of us and caring and, and, and maybe a, a family member that not quite so much. The thing about family is, is that when a family member rejects you, it seems to hurt more than when anybody else rejects you. Uh, it just goes deeper and has a greater impact. When family fails to keep promises, it doesn't just feel like a broken promise. It feels like betrayal. And uh, that's a very difficult thing emotionally to work our way through. 
And if you've ever had a family member that acted embarrassed to be around you, uh, that's a particularly painful thing to have to walk through. And the result is sometimes we can fantasize that we would be part of another family, that someone would say, oh, you were switched at birth in the hospital, and you actually belong to this wonderful, very rich, very powerful family, and they've been looking all over, and finally they found you and how great they are. Or maybe you've promised yourself that your family is going to look very different from the family that you came from. That's usually what we do. It's amazing, though, how deep the programming can go. I was at a conference not long ago, and this is what the speaker said. Jesus may be in your heart, but Grandpa's in your bones. <laughs> and it's, just, it's a little bit scary. But God had an idea for the human family, for his family. And when there's multiple references to brothers and sisters and family in the passage that we just read. And, and God's idea for the human family is that they were created to rule. They weren't just going to be run over by everything that happened in life or constantly in a fragile state where they would not have any sense of confidence or capacity to assess what the next thing could be in their lives. The thing is, is that humans try to rule. We really do. We try to make things better. We try to take control over things. But we often uh, have side effects and unexpected consequences that we couldn't foresee. Even the good that we tend to do sometimes bounces back in ways we couldn't calculate. And uh, in our world, uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of authority, but there does seem to be a lot of intimidation. And some people actually think they're the same thing. And in those environments, people get taken advantage of a lot. And a lot of people get broken. And we learn to keep our mouths shut and to sit down and not try to make waves because there is a cost for that. Now, what's fascinating about this is it tells us in the passage, a reference to uh, Psalm 8 where it says, we're made a little lower than the angels. Now, if, if you know anything about angels uh, from Scripture, they're mentioned over 100 times in the Old Testament, 160 times in the New Testament. Uh, these are remarkable creatures with uh, powers and abilities that you and I do not possess. Uh, much stronger, uh, just capable of doing amazing things. And this is what's really interesting about this passage. It says that we're made lower than the angels. We have less power, but we have more responsibility. It says there's actually coming a time when humans are going to be responsible to rule this world and everything that God has put in it. And then he, he says, because he knows what we're all thinking, right? But that's not happening right now. We don't see that but we can see Jesus. And so the point of looking to Jesus is, is, is a multifaceted thing. And what he begins to unfold for us is that this is the way we move from the broken human family reality to the family of God. And it's not about necessarily being relocated to somewhere else in a city, state, or country where you're connected with people that you would like better or they would like you better. But it's this idea of the family of God that, that Jesus is actually our brother and he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. And there's a kind of celebration and faithful commitment that he makes and keeps with us. And that this family experience does something that we don't expect it to do. It actually helps us to begin to exercise what God intended originally. That the, the rule of God not only flows into our life but through our lives and we begin to rule in life. So, wow, I don't know how that works. That's not been my experience. Well, I think this is a really good talk for you today then. So Adam and Eve, they were, they were the first ones, right? They were told to rule everything that God had created and, and, and to be fruitful and to multiply. And they have all this opportunity and all of this potential. But they wanted, they'd wanted something more than just to rule what was under them. They wanted to rule themselves. And they actually bought into the notion, which a lot of people do, that if God is not ruling my life, then I can rule my life. But the challenge is, once we step away from God, we don't rule our lives, and we lose our capacity to rule the things that we're supposed to. And Adam and Eve kind of made that mistake. So without God, we seem 
unable to rule ourselves. In fact, in spite of our best intentions, they're often overruled or undermined. And we get very frustrated and fatigued about what we try and are unable to accomplish. So the author is once again making a reference to creation. And remember, Adam and Eve were put in a position of rulership. And we're told that, that the goal of God in their creation was that they would, be, they would be people who are capable of deep and abiding relationship with God and with each other. That relationships were supposed to be life-giving and fruitful. But it didn't just stop there. They also wanted them to be able to exercise authority, meaning that it wouldn't just be the forces of nature that would determine the truth about them or their future. They wouldn't just be reacting to the things going on around them all the time, but they would be able to actually exercise authority. And, and, and the way authority always begins is by the things that we say. It's amazing how many times we just surrender authority by the things that we say out loud. And then he also wants them not only to, to have authority, but to be, to be fruitful, to cultivate the things that are, are nourishing and good in life, to actually take something that's good and make it better. This is what God intended for people. And without God, we're not able to do any of that. We just keep struggling over and over again. Well, what is it that keeps us? How, you know, once we came out from that rule, what is it that's the controlling factor that keeps us from exercising rule, from going deep in life-giving relationships to, to actually having some authority in our life, to take something that's good and make it better? What is the thing that stops us? And this passage reveals that. It targets it. And what it tells us is fear is what robs our capacity to rule. Fear is what robs our capacity to rule. We, we are afraid, and uh, we all fear different kinds of things, um, and, and fear can have a profound effect on the things that we do and the things that we don't do. I was just a little boy. My parents had taken me to a place called Six Flags Over Texas. We were visiting old friends in Texas, which is uh, where I was originally born, believe it or not. I know you're surprised because everything from Texas is supposed to be bigger, and... <laughs> Now you know that's not true. And so we had gone there, and there was this tower that, that had a slide on it. And we climbed up, and it felt like story after story after story of tower. And when I got to the top, there was this plummeting slide that went down the side of it. And, and they gave me a little square of burlap to sit on. And they said, now you just put that under you, and then you just go down the... And, and I noticed a couple things. First of all, with every step going up, I felt weaker. I noticed that. By the time I got to the top of that tower, I mean, I, my, my legs were shaking. And, and the second thing that uh, I noticed is that I decided I wasn't going to go down on that slide on this little thing. I believed that, that I would come off of that little square of burlap and that everything that happened after that would involve uh, abrasions and contusions. <laughs> And I didn't want any of it. So I looked at the person and I said, I'm, I'm not going down the slide. And they said, it's the only way down. And I said, it's not. I didn't come up the slide. <laughs> they said, you can't go down the stairs. I said, watch me. <laughs> and I walked down the stairs. And I noticed that every step I went down, I felt a little stronger. My parents thought I was crazy. They didn't know what was going on, but I knew that was not going to be an option for me. It's amazing how many things we don't do because we're afraid, and it's amazing how many things we do because we're afraid. In moments when we're supposed to exercise rule and authority and take steps forward, we find ourselves paralyzed by fear. And we all have different kinds of fears, right? And we're not all afraid of the same thing, but the author kind of identifies a, a, a root to this fear, and he calls it the fear of death. Now, I've heard people say that there are studies done that there are people who are more afraid of public speaking than death. And I don't believe it. I believe that if you gave a person a microphone and an audience and the option, they'll find something to say. I, it's just what I think is true. 
but we are afraid of death. Why are we afraid of death? Because uh, mostly every movie that shows someone dying in it, it's excruciatingly painful, and we want to avoid pain. Uh, death also means separation. Anyone who's had a loved one who's, who has uh, died, just the absence of them in, their, in your life is unbelievable. You can't pick up the phone. You, you can't text. You, you can't stop by the house. You, you don't see them for coffee. It's just this, this gaping open void in your schedule and in your life, and they're not there. And, and by the way, that's not just for people who have lost someone. When you've received a terminal diagnosis, that fear of separation affects the dying person too. It's unbelievable how powerful that is. And, and then some people think that, what if death is just the end? Like, there's nothing after this. Like, this is all there is. Uh, I actually think that's an absolutely terrifying thought. And uh, the reason is because it means that there's absolutely nothing in life that has any meaning. Nothing matters if this is all there is. Well, if this is all there is, then we should be nice. Why? What does it matter? There are people who believe, there, there are some people who believe this is all there is, and they take what they want, and they do what they want, and they don't apologize for any of it. But this, this meaning, we have a society that, that wants to lean away from believing in anything about God and eternity, and then we have trouble medicating ourselves because we can't live with the reality that life doesn't matter. That, that, that day after day, it makes no difference what I do because when I'm gone, I'm gone, and when they're gone, they're gone, and nothing lasts. That, that's a horrible way to live in a terrible, fearful thing. And then, and then what about the idea of punishment? There are some people who are worried that if there is something after death, then I could be in trouble. And we're not exactly sure where the line is because nobody other than Jesus has lived a perfect life, so where's the line? How many passes do you get? And we're all hoping we're on the right side of that line. Now, I know there's always some people who will say, Pastor, I am not afraid of death. In fact, I would welcome it. And there are some people who believe that's true. But they are very much afraid of death. Not the box they'll wind up in a hole in the ground, but the lifeless box they have to live in every single day of their life. They hate the separation. They hate the anxiety. They hate all of it. And they don't think it's ever going to change. That's what we're afraid about death, right? It's never going to change. And so they just live out that fear. And fear limits our life. Our world becomes smaller. We're afraid to use what we have because we might lose it. We're afraid to, to open relationships because we might get rejected. We're afraid to try because we might fail. We're afraid to help someone because we could be associated by others with the person we're trying to help and maybe that's not what we want. We're afraid to take responsibility because then we could be blamed. We're afraid to speak up. We're afraid to stand up. We all live out our fear and when we do, we're taken advantage of. It's not how life is supposed to be. It's not what God created us to be. So there is a way to experience what God intends life to be. But we can't do it if we keep responding out of fear. The human family is paralyzed by fear, but we can be animated by faith. This is a very different approach to life. How does this happen? God involves us in his family. He invites us to be his children. Jesus calls us his brothers and sisters. So how does this process of becoming part of God's family actually work? And it begins, first of all, the reason we're able to be part of God's family is because Jesus became fully human. Jesus was not God incognito, God pretending to be human and hiding among us. Jesus was God incarnate. God actually in the flesh. Jesus did not come to hide God, but to reveal God to us. And this is a really important thing for us to grasp. That's why this author talks so much about this, that Jesus was God in the flesh. 
that no matter, and, and when we look at the life of Jesus, it's astonishing what we see in his life. He becomes one of us, and in every situation, he always responds to what his father wants him to do and what his father wants him to say. That's what he said, right? He said, I always do what I see my father do. I always say what I hear my father say. Now, what has happened is, is he's come under the authority of his father, and because now he is under the rule of God, he begins to rule in life. This is how it actually works. That when we decide we want to be in charge and we want to rule, we wind up not able to rule ourselves or much else. But Jesus shows us how to actually rule life. The God who made you wants you to live out the potential he created in you. And he knows how that happens. So how does this actually work? I mean, wouldn't it be great if there were a, a simple course to take? And, and this is why you're not going to like this next point. But it's true. Jesus suffered for us. Jesus suffered for us. That for us to surrender our will and come under God's will creates, creates some, some uncomfortable realities in our lives and in the lives of people around us. Now, this idea of God suffering for us, everybody, when they talk about Jesus, they, they, they say things like this. Even people who don't believe he was the son of God or anything like that. Well, Jesus was a good person. He was a really good person. I mean, he fed people who were hungry. He was kind. He ministered to those who were outcasts in society. He didn't treat people differently. I mean, what a nice person. Uh, can I just suggest to you, he was killed. If he was so nice, why did they kill him? There were lots of people that didn't like what Jesus had to say. Why? It's because when he began to talk, people began to step out of fear and into faith. And our world doesn't much like that because our world is run by fear. It's run by fear. So this idea that Jesus would suffer for us. Now remember, these believers, these Hebrews, are Jewish people who've been raised in the traditions and scripture of Judaism all their lives, and they've discovered that Jesus is the Messiah, and that's why there was all those references to Old Testament passages. But among Jewish people, it was unthinkable that God would ever suffer because the idea of suffering was the reason you suffered is because you sinned. And God would never sin, and God would never die. And so if, if, if you say that around people who are very strong in Jewish faith, the, usually the word, God forbid, well, the language will come up. They were offended because how could Jesus suffer? If Jesus is God, he can't suffer. That's very uncomfortable for religious people to think about. They always see suffering as punishment. My dad was involved in an accident many, many years ago in which 22 bones of his body were broken. He was laying in a hospital bed when a visiting pastor from the community came in to see him and said to him, what sin did you commit that caused you to be in this situation? My dad told me later that it was really good he had 22 broken bones or he would have committed another sin right then. <laughs> we, we said, well, I don't think that way. Yes, you do. Because when something is going wrong in your life that you didn't see coming, you always think, what did I do to deserve this? Don't you? It's what we do because we've been so infected with this fear-based model of living and part of families that can't live up to their potential. And that's why God invites us into his family. It makes all the difference in the world. God knew that unless someone paid the unbelievably high price for our sins, that we would always be stuck in this situation. And so Jesus, who did not sin, paid the price for our sins. And that's what's so offensive to people about Jesus. My sins are not so bad that anyone would have to die for me. And there it is. That's the reason. But Jesus does. 
He took our place. And he did that to break the power of the one who holds the power of death. But he couldn't do this by avoiding suffering, which is how most of us navigate our lives. We, we don't choose the best thing. We just choose the least expensive thing. We don't choose the best thing. We just choose the least painful thing. I mean, when was the last time you saw something on television that just said, if you tried this program, it's going to grind you down to dust. It's going to take every ounce of strength that you have. Every muscle in your body is going to ache for months. You are going to feel like you are starving to death, but in 90 days, you're going to look like a new person. Nobody says that. They don't. What do they say? They say, these simple little steps, just five minutes a day. Eat what you want. Work out on this little machine and look what will become of you. We're always looking for the suffer-free experience for everything. And Jesus did not rule suffering out. He didn't seek suffering as though it's a virtue. There's a whole thing in religious circles, not just Christianity, but all religions of the world, where people think that if you inflict pain on yourself, that there's spiritual benefit. And uh, that's not a healthy approach. It's not about seeking suffering. It's about not allowing suffering to make decisions for you. Because that's where all our regret comes from. We look back over our lives. He suffered for us, and he shows us the way. He's a pioneer. The pioneer not only in that he paid the price for us, but he shows us we don't have to recoil when things get hard or difficult or painful that they don't end us and they don't define us. Not only did Jesus suffer for us, but Jesus suffered with us. This is a really interesting concept. And what it tells us in that passage is because he suffers with us or suffered with us, he is a faithful and merciful high priest. He was willing to make the atonement for our sins, to, to pay the price necessary. But he knows what suffering is like. He understands our fears. He understands our temptations. He knows it all. That's what makes him faithful and merciful. This is what it says. He will never be ashamed to call you his brothers and sisters. So, well, he might think that of some people, but not me. No, he understands what you've been through. He gets it. And you will never hear Jesus ashamed to call you a brother and sister. That's mind-boggling to me. And yet he does. So when you are experiencing suffering, how should you manage this? What I can tell you is just start a conversation with God. Tell him how you actually feel about it. If you're afraid, say, I'm afraid. If you're angry, say, I'm angry. If you're confused, say you're confused. Start a conversation with God. But please listen. I said conversation, not a monologue. Sometimes we just kind of throw the prayer out. Let God feed back some information to you that could be really, really useful and helpful. In prayer, a lot of times, we just consider prayer the part where we're talking. And there's some value to listening. And here's how it works with most people. After you've talked to God about the things that concern you, you just wait silently and see what he brings to your mind. It's amazing the kind of insights that start coming if you just pause and listen and just begin to listen. But listen, when those insights come, we need to respond with humility. There are things we don't know. There are things we don't understand. There are things we can't calculate and figure out on our own. And so we just have to humbly accept that God is, wants to work through us and in us. But please listen. The goal is not just to avoid suffering. The goal is so that you live out the potential of being part of the family of God. And that is not a guaranteed no suffering environment. So, this is what we know. Jesus says he'll never be ashamed of us. 
In fact, that passage that referred back to Psalm it said that there's, there's actually a song that he sings. There's an earworm, catchy tune in heaven, and there's a verse with your name in it. And this is what we know. Why would he sing about me? Because he sees how his grace is transforming you. He sees the progress that you make. Um, we tend not to see progress. He sees the battles that you are winning. You say, I'm not winning battles. For some of you this morning, just being in this room was a battle you had to win. And you should know, when Jesus sees that, he breaks into song. He said, that's my brother, that's my sister. They're fighting the battle. He sees the influence that we are having, which we are often completely blind to. As we live out our faith, we have no idea all the ripples we put into motion of grace in the world around us. He sees the future and our potential, and he sees the steps that we're taking for it. And because of that, he bursts into song. And I know what you're saying. I don't see it. And that's what the author said. We don't see this presently, but we do see Jesus. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, what I'd like you to do right now is just identify at least one thing that you fear. Um, not just being afraid of heights or maybe you fear uh, if you tell the truth to someone, the relationship will be over. Maybe you fear taking a risk because if it doesn't work you'll always be identified as the person who failed maybe you're afraid that if you give everything you've got you have nothing to show for it um, I've never met a marriage couple in, in a marriage who didn't think of things that they wanted to say, but were afraid to say, and that could have made all the difference in the world. Parents who got momentarily embarrassed and didn't want to say out loud something to their children that could have invested life, or children to their parents. You, maybe God's, you've had an, um, You've had some thoughts that seemed interesting to you about ways to help or serve or use a gift, but you're afraid. Identify that thing. Father, we are full of fear. And it dominates us in ways we, we just have trouble It paralyzes us. It makes our world so small. Would you help us to be animated by faith today? Would you help us recognize that we are part of a family that will, you will never be ashamed to say we belong to you. That when you think of us, when you see us, a smile comes to your face. That you laugh easy want to wrap us up in your arms and never let us go and because of that truth we are able to take steps of faith instead of fear help us take those steps today in Jesus name amen let's stand together